Today on Dr. Phil, she made a big mistake. You moved your daughter's boyfriend into your house when she was 16? Now she's paying for it. They look like slobs. That house was like that. You sleep till 3 in the afternoon. Not true. Yes, you know. I mean, somebody tell me the truth. Plus, we have created a monster by never telling her no. She will throw tantrums. 13, and spoiled rot. Do you cut up her food? Yeah, cut it all up. And she's 13? Let's do it. Why don't we stop all the drama, stop all the fighting, and let's go get you better. Here we go. Have a good show, everybody. If I can help get this family back on track, are you willing to do that? Ready, free. Take. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Go, Dr. Bell. Take a look at this charming suburban home. Looks great, right? The front door hides a secret, and inside, you'll find the real story. Boxes strewn about, an old mattress in the living room, dirty dishes piled high, filthy carpeting, holes in the walls. Ugh. Not a pretty picture. Sort of like a vacant house you'd expect squatters to inhabit. Well, my first guest, Tracy, didn't abandon her house when she moved out six months ago, and she didn't let squatters move in. Instead, she allowed her 22-year-old daughter, Ashley, to live there rent-free, where she sleeps all day, and according to mom, freeloads all night. When the economy crashed, I downsized to an apartment, and my daughter and her boyfriend still live in the bank-owned home for free. Andrew and I are staying here because we can't afford to get an apartment right now. Ashley and Andrew are both moochers. I am not a moocher. It couldn't be farther from the truth. Ashley and Andrew are both broke. I pay for 100% of all of their expenses. I'm paying for all my bills. I think Tracy is trying to make a bigger deal of what's really going on. Ashley and Andrew don't pay for anything. Gas, food, toothpaste, deodorant, toilet paper, nothing. The only time I ask my mom for things is if I work for it. Supporting myself and Ashley and Andrew is financially draining. I'm not sure if I can pay bills because I'm paying their bills first. Ashley and Andrew swear that they've done everything they possibly could to get a job. I've been applying to many places and I just haven't heard anything back from anyone. The most frustrating thing is if Ashley and Andrew aren't working, they will sleep all day long. I don't know what else to do. I've tried the tough love thing, but I always end up caving back in because I can't stand the thought of my daughter not eating. So I think my mom's making a very big deal out of this. Ashley and Andrew live in a fantasy world. I'm done. I can't take it anymore. Okay. Now, we're going to meet those kids in a minute, but I want to get your point of view, and then we're going to get theirs, and I got a sneaking suspicion that they're going to disagree with your ideas here. What, do you agree? Yes, I totally agree. Um, but yeah. your view is what? That you're being taken advantage of? For many years. For many years. And that your daughter's a moocher and that she's exploiting you and her boyfriend too? They just expect everything. How did you get in this situation? Uh, I'm a single mom. She doesn't have a father in her life. I want to make sure that I'm the mother, the father, everything that she needs in her life. But now I look back and wish I wouldn't have done everything, given her everything that I did, because I did give her everything she could possibly want. And you did that why? I mean, was this a guilt thing? Yes. Because let me, let me tell you, one of the reasons that I agreed to do this story is because it's a cautionary tale. It's a cautionary tale for parents out there right now that are parenting from guilt. I, I, I didn't give them the life I planned, so I'm going to buy them the life that I planned. I'm going to... They're going to have the clothes, the toys, the games, the cars, the trips, the whatever. I, I'm going to I'm going to do that for them. That's exactly and what I've done. So, so you think that's what you did here? I know that's what I did. Where are Lori and Todd? You, you guys are down here. Yes. Okay, because I'm going to be talking to you later in the show, and this is a cautionary tale because your daughter's how old? Thirteen. Thirteen. And you're hearing her say some things that y'all say to yourselves right now, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. They have a 13-year-old daughter. That's about when it started. Yeah. And so you, you pay close attention. I'm getting to y'all. <laughs> now, Tracy returned to the house to show us just how Ashley and her boyfriend have, in, in your view, trashed it. But when she got there, Tracy was in for a surprise. Apparently, all it takes for her daughter uh, to clean it up was a phone call that the Dr. Phil show was coming with some cameras. Take a look. Ashley and Andrew live like slobs. Ashley and Andrew will go three weeks without doing the dishes. Sometimes the house is dirty, but I mean, anybody's house is dirty sometimes. So I take care of the house. I'm always cleaning this house. I wouldn't even go use the bathroom. Hair on the floor, towels everywhere, clothes, dog pee in the corner, disgusting. Ash and Andrew have no cable, no TV, no telephone. It's very tough for me to go visit the house. It's not the house that I left. Looks a little different than the last time I was here. I don't see any piles of dog feces on the floor. I guess I should have called the Dr. Phil show a long time ago. House actually looks pretty decent. They do have a little bit of food in the freezer. Package of hot dogs is mice. This is the pantry that I always kept stock full from top to bottom. Now there's nothing. It looks like they do have a few things in there. This one area is where they're confined to. They're in this room 90% of the time when they're in this house. They even have their own little fridge now, so they don't have to go down to, all the way down the stairs to the big fridge in the kitchen. We have a microwave, so they don't have to run all the way downstairs to warm food up. We have a collection of barn animals, three rabbits inside. They've obviously come through and uh, made it look really nice for Dr. Phil. I'm freaked out because it's so clean and bare, but I'm also just wondering why she couldn't do this sooner. Why is it more important for her to make the house look nice for Dr. Phil than to make it look nice for the person that built it for her, which is me. Oh, okay, now, she's living there with her boyfriend, right? right? And he's here today mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Did he live in the house when you were there? Yes. When did he move in? Oh, probably four and a half years ago. Okay, you moved your daughter's boyfriend into your house when she was 16? Yes. What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> <clears throat> Seriously, I don't get, I don't get that. I, I wasn't. Because I've raised two boys. Robin and I have two boys, and, and we raised those boys. And I, I think back to when either one of our boys were 16, moving a girlfriend into our house. Did, did, did that ever occur? We never had this conversation. Did that ever occur to you? Never, never. Under what theory would we I have hope. moved a little girl into our house? <laughs> we would not have moved a little girl in for them, maybe for me, you know, just to dress. Yeah, you would have loved to have had a little girl. <laughs> not for them. <laughs> never. I, I'm sorry. I, I, hell, tell me how that came up. He's 18, she's 16. I'm going to move him in. Were they sexually active at the time? Um, Obviously they were, but did you know they were? As far as I knew, no. He was, he was at my house all the time. Um, he had family issues. Um, I was dealing with medical issues. I, I wasn't right. I don't know how to explain it other than it was the worst mistake I've ever made. I've regretted it every day since I did it. Right now, those two are living in this house we saw. Yes. And this house is in foreclosure. Right. They'll be homeless. Yes because they don't have jobs, but they do work for you some. Right. Okay, and by the way, they say you pay them sometimes and you don't pay them sometimes. <laughs> they say you pay them based on your mood. And they're gonna tell their side of this, and to, to get your side of it, if I understand this clearly, is you're saying, I, I raised a daughter that, by the way, seems to me to be a lovely young woman yeah. that seems to not have a lot of traction right now in life, uh, is living in a very compromised situation, in kind of a vacant house, living in one room, just existing. And you're saying, I, I haven't equipped her to survive. And if I fell off the world tomorrow, she's ill-equipped. And, I, and I'm, I'm panicked at what would happen. Yes. Right? Very. So you're saying, so I admit that I didn't prepare her, so what do I do now? D do I get it? Yes. We've got a couple coming up with a 13-year-old version of how you're describing your daughter, but If you would have told me at 13 that her boyfriend would be living in my house when she was almost 17, yeah, I would have said, absolutely not. That's ridiculous. You don't do that. Yeah, well, wait till you hear this story. 
All right, next, Tracy's daughter says she's extremely offended, offended that her mother thinks she's living off of her. Well, we're going to hear her side and her boyfriend's side when we come back. It doesn't make me feel good that my mom calls me a moocher. Growing up, I gave Ashley absolutely everything she ever wanted. The spoiling kind of ended when I became an adult. I don't know how to say no to Ashley. Ashley called me at 1.30 in the morning, three days ago. Woke me up and said, Mom, I don't have any cigarettes. Can I come get five bucks so I can get a pack of cigarettes? And I lost it. I said, yeah, go ahead, come over. She walked in the door, I said, really? Is this seriously still happening? You're 22 years old, and you're gonna call me at 1.30 in the morning because you don't have money for cigarettes, and neither does your boyfriend. And I did give her the $5. Now, 1.30 in the morning, she's at your house. How did she get there? She drove the car that I paid for. Okay, where'd she get the gas? The money that I'd given her earlier that week for the gas. To put in a car that you paid for. Ashley says it's offensive that her mother feels this way and she wants to tell her side of the story. Take a look at this. Ashley is a lazy, entitled moocher, and I've made her that way. It doesn't make me feel good that my mom calls me a moocher. Growing up, I gave Ashley absolutely everything she ever wanted. My mom did give me a lot of things when I was younger, but the spoiling kind of ended when I became an adult. I don't know how to say no to Ashley. My relationships have definitely been affected by the mooching. She always tries to blame her failed relationships on me. When you're in a relationship with somebody, you don't want your 22-year-old daughter calling you at 1 o'clock in the morning saying she needs $20 for gas. I don't believe how anyone could say that a child was the main reason for a breakup. I've had relationships end because they just don't want to deal with the daughter drama. My mom blames me for a lot of things in her life that she shouldn't. She doesn't want to take any of the blame. Okay, you've been watching so far, right? Yes. And what do you think about what your mom has had to say? It sounds to me like she's taken plenty of accountability and responsibility for this. I'm very surprised about a couple things that she said. Which are? that she felt bad, bad for Andrew when he moved in and that he was having family issues because he was fine with his family. Well, what's your point? You're, you're how old now? 22. D does it seem in retrospect, does it make sense to you for a 16-year-old girl to have her boyfriend move into her house? No. I mean, I wouldn't let my daughter do it, and I was very thankful that she did it. Is this a serious relationship you have with him? Yes. And how's he doing on taking care of you and providing for you and protecting you and nurturing you and well, all the things that people do in relationships? Right now, um, neither one of us are doing very good, but he has had many jobs in the past, and he always took care of me when he had those jobs. Mm -hmm. But just right now, he doesn't. Right now, we're going through a pretty tough time. Mm -hmm. So how would you say your life is working for you overall right now? Life's hard for me right now. Yeah. Are you, do you have a job? With my mom, part-time. Why do you work for your mother? Um, she owns her own painting company, and Andrew and I are her only employees right now. Mm -hmm. She has had other employees in the past, but right now it's, it's just us working. For her. But why work for your mother? Why, why not just go out and get her a job? Well, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, see, my theory is that if you don't have a job, then your job is finding a job. Right. And, like, if you had a job, you would work 40 or 50 hours a week. You would, like, get up at 7 o'clock, and you would shower, and then you would go out, and you would work all day long, and then you would come home. And so you would be gone by 7, and you would be home by 6. And so if you don't have a job, you would spend all of that time looking for a job. So you'd get up, you would be showered at 7, you would be dressed, you'd be out the door, and you would be out looking for a job, and you would spend all day looking for a job, every day, all day, looking for a job. Those are the people that find jobs. Do you do that? It's hard when you don't have a phone 
to call anyone or you don't have gas in your car or you don't have a, access to a computer all the time. So whenever I have access to those things, that's what I'm doing. So that would be no. <laughs> My question to you was, do you get up every day and go look for a job every day? where you knock on a door, you go to the mall, you go from store to store to store to store, you go to fast food alley, and you knock on every door to door to door to door to door, or you go whatever, you go knock on doors in the neighborhood, can I rake your leaves, can I fix your fence, can I work in your house, can I do whatever, you go knock on every door till you get a job and you get paid. And I'm asking you, do you do that? And you say, no, you gave me five excuses. Well, it's hard when you don't have a computer, you don't have a phone, you don't have gas for your car, you don't have this, you don't have that. And the answer is no, you don't. You sleep till three in the afternoon, true? Not true. Not true, does she sleep till three in the afternoon? Yes, she does. I mean, somebody tell me the truth. Don't tell me she sleeps till three in the afternoon. If she's not, don't tell me you aren't if you are. Tell me the truth. The truth is I don't know the last six months because I have not lived there, I have my own place now. <clears throat> but six months ago and before that yes if we were not working they would not come out of the bedroom until sometimes four or five o'clock in the afternoon and coming out of the bedroom doesn't mean that we're sleeping that just means that we haven't came well, down were, any, to were, were people coming to your bedroom and knocking on the door to offer you jobs no so i'm saying <laughs> if you if you want a job you have to get out because you can do what you need to do is there a day in the last month that you've looked for a job 10 hours a day not for 10 hours no Eight hours. Six, five, Six four. Six hours, yeah. Where you've gone out and knocked on doors and interviewed for jobs. On the, applying for jobs on the internet, not out yeah. for six hours. Yeah, the truth that is that that doesn't work. If you endorse her lifestyle, that's very sad. If you accept your lifestyle, your, your station in life right now, that's very sad. That, that's very sad. I would hope neither of you do that. There is a deadline looming how much longer can Andrew and Ashley live like squatters in a foreclosed home? At any point, the bank could show up and say, you're out. And if they have no job and nowhere to go, they become homeless overnight. It could happen before the end of this sentence. We'll add Andrew to this conversation when we come back. Andrew is just annoying. Everything Andrew does annoys me. I'm angry with Tracy. Her telling everyone else about how we're moochers. I want him to live up to the man that I want my daughter to spend the rest of life with. Well, we've been talking with Tracy, who admits that she spoiled her daughter, Ashley, when she was younger. She says she turned her into a lazy and entitled adult that she is today. Ashley disagrees with her mom. She says she and her boyfriend, Andrew, are struggling to make ends meet on her own. She says that's true, but she says, look, we're trying. It is tough out there right now. Everybody knows it's a tough job market and a tough economy, but it's not that we're not trying. Here's what Andrew has to say. Andrew's just annoying. Everything Andrew does annoys me. I hate the way he eats. I hate the way he walks. I hate the way he talks. He's just annoying. I'm angry with Tracy. Her telling everyone else about how we're moochers and we're this and we're that. Andrew has never mooched off my mom. Andrew is always giving me everything that he could. I want him to live up to the man that I want my daughter to spend the rest of life with. She'll tell Ashley, oh, he's such a loser. She doesn't think that we should be together. Thanks for joining us. You've been watching everything, right? Yeah. What would you like to add to the conversation we're having so far? Just that um, Tracy seems like a lot of the stuff she had said isn't the truth at all. Well, clear it up. Sleeping till 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. There was a point when we did do that. We've done that before. We've slept in. I look for jobs. She kind of made it sound like I've never had a job. The whole time I've been living there, the whole time I've been dating I Ashley, have a job. Um, I have had a job. Okay, I've had I've had about six jobs. I work in the summer most and of the time. And you're 24. You've had six jobs. Why are y'all living in that house? Looks like oh that squalor. Okay, that's another thing. That house was like that when she was but, living there. She contributed to the way that the house but looks now. Why are you living Her, like that? That's not. 
from the dogs. That's from someone that she brought over wearing their shoes all the time, tracking tar into the house. Yeah, oh, I don't care what that is. That, that's nasty looking. It does look yellow against the wall where dogs pee against the wall. We've had it shampooed before, but. I mean, it's not, that's, you can't blame okay. everything on us. I'm not saying that. I never said that the carpet was completely <clears throat> because of you guys. That's not the point of this. Okay, you have questions that, that I, I want to answer. Do, do y'all have any questions? No, I, I just no? have stuff that I feel like wasn't said. Like, I've, I've worked with her <clears throat> so many times over the years that I've been with Ashley in the years that I've been living there. And when they work for, with me, it's great, but yeah, they have to be well. on time. No, you need to stop hiring them, okay? That's called enmeshed. You're getting enmeshed in their lives. There's two... You, you ask me, what can I do? If they don't work for me, I'm paying their bills anyway, so at least I can get some okay, work out of the Okay, you need deal. to That's stop that, it. too. Okay, now listen, you ask me, and I'm going to tell you, and then you can either do it or not. I okay. understand that. I, I don't control this. All I can do is tell you. You need to quit hiring these people because it's, you're too involved. There's, there's other people to hire, and there's other jobs to get. You're over-involved. You need to stop that. And you say, well, I might as well hire them because I'm paying their bills anyway. Well, here's good news number two. You need to stop that. Necessity is the mother of invention. And as long as you continue to enable the behavior that you don't want, it's going to keep happening. Now, you shouldn't have to come all the way here for me to tell you that, but since you did, I am. You need to stop hiring them, and you need to stop paying their bills. Listen, two wrongs don't make a right. You said when she was growing up, you, you, you parented from guilt. It didn't prepare her the first time. It isn't preparing her now. So stop doing that. Okay? Anybody that works for their mother, that's wrong. Yes. It is? Yes. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> You're doing this for you, not for her. You're doing this because it lessens your anxiety. It lessens your guilt. You feel better. So you need to stop making yourself feel better at her expense. Can I say something? Not yet. Okay. So she can okay? okay? Do you get that? I do. So you need to stop hiring her, and you need to stop paying her bills. One and two. That's two key things. Okay, I'm sorry. Now, Go she ahead. said she pays 100% of my bills. But that's not true. It's not true. We work okay. for a lot of times. We'll do jobs, and she'll say, "Okay, if you, you know, if you work real hard and get this done in this amount of time, you, you get it done fast. I'll pay you extra." Right. And I told him uh, that. I'll pay you extra, and she doesn't. Really. Ninety percent of the time, she really? won't. She'll say, "I don't have that. I don't okay. have the who money." Made, who made, who made I your guys' carpet in the last hold two hold months? Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, a minute. wait a minute. Look, you're getting ready to spend five minutes of my life I can't get back, and I. <laughs> Th this is why you shouldn't have them working for you. She'll owe us money sometimes to where our bills are late for months and months. I have never, months. ever owed either okay, one but of See, this is going to all be solved. See, this is going to all be solved. But I, really? But see, this is all solved. You, you see how much gets fixed by just number one? Can you please have them explain to me when did I borrow money? No, it doesn't matter. Oh, wait, wait, wait. See, you can't give me that five minutes back. Uh, <laughs> see, this is that five minutes. You can't give me back. I'm getting old. I need that five. See, but this is, see, you see what's solved when you quit, when you quit working together? Are you seeing a pattern here? And yep. that's another thing. She likes to do stuff for Ashley just so she can hold it over her head, just so she can throw it in her face. Yeah, just like with the car. That. With the car. She said when that, when that was first, when she first got it, it was for Ashley graduating. Okay? It was supposed to be, you know, I'll, I'll put this money down for you for the car for graduating. I never told you and you then, had to get a job and make every payment, keep the job and keep your grades up. I didn't tell you that. She, you weren't around, so you can't kept, justify to that. Okay, well, y'all don't need around. me for this. Is there anything else that you wanted to get said? Yeah, I mean, there is. I, I never had any problems with my family, ever. She okay. said she felt sorry for me. I was living on, I was living on my own with some friends. And but I was going over, I was going, I was going to my, I was going to her house a lot. And I would fall asleep sometimes, but sometimes, I, you know, I would leave. She's the one who said, he's, he's here all the time. Why don't he just move in? No, it wasn't. I said, I said, oh, you know, well, I, you know, I guess that'll work as, if that's what Ashley wants. And that's, you know, that's what happened. A Ashley didn't really, Ashley wasn't begging her to let me move in. 
It didn't happen like that at all. If you listen to anything I'm saying, you either feed off this or you're going to take my advice because you are over-involved. Necessity is the mother of invention. Stop working these guys in your business. Stop doing it and stop paying the bills. You need to sever the financial ties here. Sever it. Have a relationship with your daughter as a daughter. Have no financial ties whatsoever. None. Zip. Zero. Not a. That. That's what I need help with. Well, I'm t it's real easy to not do something. It's harder to teach you to do something. You just don't do it. You learn how to say no, no. Not going to do it. Stop asking. Don't do it. Because I'm telling you something. Every time you do it, you're doing it for you and at her expense. You said, I want her to learn to do for herself, then stop doing for her. You crippled her by spoiling her. So she entered the world without the skill sets necessary to do it. Don't do it again. It's not too late for her to learn. Are you going to stop hiring them? Yes, I am. Are you going to stop paying their bills? Yes, I am. Loaning them money, giving them money. You need to learn to say no. It's just that simple. They're able-bodied. They can make money. They can get jobs. But they won't as long as they don't have to. Right. Okay? It's just that simple. So, but, but and you've got some guilt here that you need to deal with, and I will get you some help with that. I really will. I will get you some help with that. This will seem so clear to you in a very short period of time. You will look back and go, oh, my God. I already am doing that. Yeah, well, You're I saying that, so. there's, that there's no, any, anybody that works for their mother, that's wrong. She's not going to hire you two anymore. Yeah, I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. Okay, but you're saying that's, that's wrong? That's wrong for, for, us to work with, for us to work with her. It's wrong. Yes. It is? Yes. It's not important that she understands. It's important that she understands because she's the one that does the hiring. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, I won't work for her again now. Good. I mean, so but. then we're on the same page. You'll support me. You really shouldn't. You shouldn't work for her. All right, when we come back, we're going to meet a mom and dad who are sitting down here watching their future flash before their eyes because they give in to their daughter's demands and say they've got a monster on their hands. This could potentially be um, even worse. We'll be right back. With my daughter, she doesn't get her way. She will throw tantrums, kicks, punches, fits, yell, scream. We spoil her rotten. My wife and I have both enabled her. Most of the time, it is just easier just to give her what she wants rather than deal with all the drama. husband Todd say their 13 year old daughter throws tantrums manipulates them to get what she wants they're fed up but admit they are unable to say a critical word no my 13 year old daughter's behavior has gotten so out of control that she controls the whole household she actually rules everything we do when she doesn't get her way she will throw tantrums stop videotaping me oh my god Kicks, punches, fits, yell, scream. My daughter treats me like a doormat, orders me around. She'll always say, shut the frick up. Zero respect. My daughter is a total slob. Wherever my daughter sits, there's going to be a stash of chips, a couple drinks in every room. She never picks up after herself, never. She tells me that I can't force her to do any kind of chores because they have child labor laws and she will report me. We spoil her rotten. We have given her the iPad, the iPhone, Xbox 360, Wii's. For her birthday, she was only given $150 this year, and she told us we were cheap and selfish. She's never satisfied. Every time you get her one thing, she wants more. My wife and I have both enabled her. Most of the time, it is just easier just to give her what she wants rather than deal with all the drama. We have created a monster by never telling her no and she's had zero discipline. At this point, I, I don't have any answers. I don't know what to do with her. We are totally at our wit's end. 
Okay. Um, let me just say up front, I, I got some good news for you. Okay. I, I'm not here to throw you all under the bus. Y you would fit nicely. <laughs> um, but I'm not here to throw you under the bus because you need a solution, right? Yep. But you, you, you recognize you got a problem here. I, I have such a big yes. problem. Right? Yeah, that's right. And, and you understand that every year older she gets, yep. this is a serious problem. Mm -hmm. And it's going to get harder and harder to deal with. Yep. But yet, you two didn't write in to me. Nope. She did. This is your other daughter. This is your 18-year-old daughter. We thought daughter. it was crazy that she wrote in to you. Yeah. Why did you write in? Because I go to college and I still live at home and I have to be the person d around it all day. I'm affected. Now, why did she write in and you guys didn't? Because we were just planning on living that way, I guess, forever. Uh, well, I mean, I believe that we try. We we always try. We, there's not a day that goes by that I don't think that we, we try to do the right thing. We got the tail wagging the dog here, right? We got a, we've got a 13-year-old, and by the way, we're not showing her face and we're not saying her name right. because she's a minor, and I don't mm -hmm. think you hold minors up to ridicule because her behavior is so atrocious yep. that it would be embarrassing. Correct. And you, you're letting her get away with this, right? We've got a 13-year-old child that is terrorizing and dominating one, two adults and an older sister. Yes. And she tells you to shut up 20 times a day. All the time. Shut the freak up. When you tell her you can't afford something, she just attacks you physically. She'll push me and call me cheap and selfish. Well, you fix dinner for the family, but she doesn't eat that. Right. You have to go get her something different, right. take out. Yes. Even for breakfast. All the time. You use coupons sometimes. Yeah, I never okay. have till recently. I and what does she call you when you use? A scumbag. Because you use coupons. Yes. yes. Why are you a scumbag because you use coupons? Because she thinks that's just embarrassing and makes you look cheap. What did she do when you had your prom? Um, she cried and complained that it wasn't fair that I had a day about me. That it's she should be getting me, yeah. some compensation for my joy. <laughs> What did you give her for her birthday? This year? Yeah. $150. And she's 13? You give her $150? And I assume she was thrilled with that. She was, that was, Not at all. A, that was the worst birthday. That was the least we've ever given her. So when she was 12, what did she get? An iPad. No, no. no that, that was, was the, the year, year before. before. We oh, she was 11, she got an iPad. <laughs> Yeah, that was when they first came See, out. See, Dad, oh, you're putting your in a corner. It's a hard act to follow. Oh, we, gave, it is what it is. we gave her no. 300 cash and took her to Carlo's Bakery in Hoboken, New Jersey. For a cake. For a cake. Yeah, so when she got to 150, what did she do? She just wasn't happy. And she cried. cried and she kept asking for more. And she ordered dresses. She, she ordered, ordered, dre ordered dresses. She ordered dresses at the end of, uh, you know, it was September. And that, you know, dresses that she would not be able to wear, I couldn't, I, I kept saying, well, you're not making any sense. Do not make that decision. You know, you're only having $150. Buy something that you're not going to grow out of by next spring when you go to wear them. They're not going to fit you. You've wasted your money. Uh, I don't care. That's, that's what I want. It's my birthday. I'm, I'm going to spend it on my money. It's Whatever not just money. It's her personality. It's the way she... So what happens when you do discipline her? What, do you ground her? They we say they're going to and it doesn't last. They all talk, no action. So do you ground her? Yeah. What, what does she do when you say you're grounded? No, no I'm not. not. She no said, yeah, whatever. Nice try. If I'm doing the grounding, I try to do it in short. You're, you know, you're grounded for two hours from the television for little things, uh, for the evening. You know, little, there's no big punishments in that sense. I don't know. I mean, it sounds different as you're saying it, but it depends on the situation. Yeah. Now. Let me see if I read this right, because I'm, sometimes I think maybe the computer spits out things that could not possibly cr be correct. Do, do you cut up her food? Oh, I didn't um, even realize I was doing it, honestly. And then I just thought about it one day. I'm like, you're 13. What am I doing? You cut up her food. Cut it all up. I butter it. And now I know that's crazy. When did that hit you? 
um, that hit me about one month ago. And she, mm -hmm. uh, she almost died when I said I'm not cutting it. She said, why are you stopping that? I don't know how to do it. It's true. Obviously, we're here because we know that we're not. I, using I, right yeah, this is so skills. embarrassing. I, I just, I need help. I don't know what to do with her. Okay. Well, um, okay. We're going to take a break. <laughs> and when we come back, I'm going to tell you something that's really going to upset you. I'm sure. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you what to do about it. Okay. All right, we'll be right back. Okay. <laughs> Now, I said there's something that's going to upset you, and I'll tell you what it is. She's close to being in violation of school requirements in terms of her tardiness, and so the truancy can kick in. Yeah, I know. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay? And what's going to happen is the school's going to report this, and basically what can happen is they can investigate this, find out what's going on, and you two can be found guilty of child abuse. And let me tell you why. Negligence is child abuse. And if you are unable to get your child to comply with the educational regimen because they won't go to school, you can't get them there, that's your fault, not the child's fault. So they can come down on you guys. So she's now putting you in harm's way for negligently parenting this child by not getting her where she's going. You, you don't want that trouble. No, she, this, this kid has to get involved. Look, here's what's happening here. You've got a really tall two-year-old. You've got, <laughs> you've got yeah. infantile tyrant here. This, you, you've got a tyrant that is just giving you hell. She's just gotten taller. But the level of development is still very infantile. Yeah. It's very demanding. Right. I want what I want when I want it, and I want it right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this has to stop right now. I don't know how to do that. Well, you're going to learn how to do that. We, we, we do talk about it. I mean, if we were able to ask and, and honestly say, she, my wife can you know, verify that it's been a major concern of mine for years that I've asked and asked and, and would say to her, we've got to stick together. Once we make a plan, let's stick <clears> to it. Right. I'll leave the room and she'll have changed that policy. And that's no longer what well, mom said I could. Yeah, well, so it's listen. Hard for, you know. I mean, no excuses. It's, this is not. This is not your daughter's problem. It's our problem. This is a family problem. Definitely. Mm -hmm. She's the. She's what we call the target patient. She's mm -hmm. the squeaky wheel. Mm -hmm. But this is the family's problem here. Sure. Because it. She wasn't born this way. She's been shaped into this. Yep. Mm -hmm. You've been caving for a long time. Oh, yeah. And it takes a whole family to create this kind of dysfunction. And we could take her off and say, okay, you're going to have to straighten up. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do this. You're going to have to do that. Then we could put her right back in this dysfunctional family situation, and it'd go right back to what it was. Right. You have to change. You have to change. Mm -hmm. Or it's not going to get any better. So there has to be a family intervention here, or this isn't going to get better. You've got to grow a spine. You've got to grow a spine, and you're going to have to do what I call some commando parenting. This girl's getting ready to go into shock. Yeah. Because you, you go back to basics. You strip this back to basics where she has a room with a bed mm -hmm. and a towel for a shower. Now, you're not going to have to shave her head or whatever, <laughs> but she's going to go back to basics, and she's going to learn that what she considers to be privilege, rights are, in fact, privileges Privilege. that are earned by treating people with dignity and respect, doing different things in terms of chores, school, things of that nature. She's going to learn that she has to do these things properly, and you guys are going to have to follow a regimen, and it is very clear to me that you cannot do this at your, on your own. So what I am going to do is I am going to get a family therapist to get involved here and come into this home and get involved with everybody, and when you don't comply, your ass is mud. <laughs> Okay? Okay. Now, I know. I'm on board. I want I'm on board. it. I want it. Okay? Because I'm talking about bringing in Rambo <laughs> here. I, I believe you. I do. Well, trust me. It's like me in a skirt. Oh. <laughs> okay? Because you are a big part of the problem. You are a big part of the mm -hmm. problem. 
And if you don't change, she has no hope. I know. I believe you. I want the help. And we're going to turn this kid around where she takes some pride in herself and what she earns and, and can take some pride in. Okay? Yes, definitely. definitely. All right, definitely. fair enough? Yes, yeah. thank you All so right. much. All right, next, I'm going to tell you three things you need to do to keep right. from spoiling your child to the point that they don't develop the skills they need to go to the next level of life. We'll be right back. Well, I want to thank all of our guests for coming here today. I said we're talking about cautionary tales. And, you know, I've always said that we want to love our children. We all want to give them things that we didn't have. But there is a point at which that can get dysfunctional. So I said there were three things that I want you to focus on in preparing your child. Number one, your child needs to experience mastery over the world. That means they need to see that they have the ability to make things happen. If I do A, I get B. That's a real empowering feeling, so that's terribly important. Number two, they need to observe themselves recover from disappointment or failure. If they try something and it doesn't work, and they go, wow, I bounced back. And number three, they need to recognize the power of giving. Think about that when you're looking at what you're planning for your child. Go to drphil.com. You can find so much more about how you can give your child the tools they need to be a success in this world. Thanks for being here. So long. Thanks, guys. Today on an all-new Dr. Phil. The most rude and difficult guest. I'm going to walk off. Are back. You're in love with Dusty. you will probably love him forever. You crawled through his bedroom window. Is she still after you? Yeah. I can't expect me to just, like, fall for you again. Plus. I received a text message that said he had passed away. Who's Disco Whole Hall? You faked your death. Yes, sir. After that show, Todd started obsessively calling and harassing the show. I'm coming out there. I believe in retribution, and I'm going to drag your little ass out of that damn studio. You lied to me. You threatened everybody on this staff, and you never apologized. This is going to be a changing day in your life. Have a good show, everybody. Here we go. It matters to you. That's what I want to talk about. Are you ready in the booth? Take Let's do it. Do it, I can Some of the most rude and difficult guests we have ever had are back. All right? Now, you guys may remember Chloe. She was the 17-year-old who stormed out of the studio when I confronted her with one of her lies. Now, she and her equally rude boyfriend, Dusty, well, they're here again. You may remember Todd. Now, he faked his own death to his wife when he pretended that he drowned in an Alaskan crab boat accident like on Deadliest Catch. Well, he was found out here on the show, and he left here and started lashing out at me and my staff. He lied. Here's just a sample of what we got from him. I'm coming after you guys, hands blazing, you damn piece of son of a bitch. Because everything you put on the damn internet is a damn lie. I will come out to L.A. this weekend. I've already made arrangements. You don't call me back. I'm coming out there, and I'm going to drag your little ass out of that damn studio. Prince of a guy. Uh, we'll hear more of those threatening voicemails a little later when Todd comes back out here to explain his outrageous behavior. But first, we're going to talk to Chloe, who was here last year with her mother and stepfather, who said her behavior and level of disrespect was out of control and is worse since she started dating a boy they felt was just bad news. Let's take a look at a little recap. What am I doing so wrong? Talking to him. That's wrong? 
Your personal life with Dusty is affecting our entire household right now. Don't try and sit here like, oh, you're so good. No, you're not, okay? Well, I'm not I here. hate you. Do you hate your mother? Yes. Why do you hate her? She is a bitch. Do you think you know everything, Dad? You really do. I'm asking for some respect in my home. You are being rude and disrespectful to everybody involved. I'm going to walk off, and it's over. Okay, but you understand that you're not telling the truth, and I can't help you. I don't you. care. I'm done. Okay. You're back. No uh, kidding. Okay. Well, you're back again. Yeah. Uh, so... You were really upset after the last show uh, because you said you were made to look crazy. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about that now? I don't know. I just want to redeem myself a little. It wasn't... I just felt like no one saw behind the scenes what was happening, you know? And everyone was questioning me all at once, and, you know, I was trying to stick up for myself, and I came off rude, but... It was just a lot. Yeah, well, you were rude. I mean, yeah, I know. I mean yeah. there's no other way to describe that. And, and here's the thing. I have to deal with the facts. And, you know, I asked you if, if you were dating Dusty. You said no. But you were. At the time, we weren't. You had seen him the night before. Yeah. And I asked you about that, and you said no. And, in fact, you had. You were lying, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the bottom line. And you went to two therapy sessions with your family when you left here. You, you, you got kicked out after two sessions, mm -hmm. right? Why? Well, I didn't want to be there. And I was trying to talk, and my mom would interrupt me, and I'd be like, can I talk? And she would just keep talking. So I was getting mad, and she said, she's like, well, can you just step out of the room for a second? Well, when I stepped out of the room, I just left. Yeah. And I never came back. Well, Chloe was in conflict with everyone on the show that we were talking about before. There wasn't one person on the stage that she got along with. Take a look, and then we'll talk about it. I'm not going to let my mom sit here and talk like she does all the time. All right, so... Look at her right now. Oh, like. Chloe, she's upset. I, I don't care. I mean she's business. Upset. I mean business, Chloe. We Good need help. Thank you, Mom. They take my car. They take my phone. For what? You think I can't get another phone? You think he can't come see me? How about because we're your parents? And if we want to take your phone, your car, computer privileges, we will. You have to acknowledge their position of authority at this point. You, it doesn't mean you agree with it, but you can't just say, I'm going to do what I want, whether you like it or whether you don't. Uh, you, you say that you actually are not living at home right now. No, I'm not. I moved out to Kansas. Right. You left there and moved to Kansas. Yes. And why Kansas? My dad's out there. You, your biological dad, because this is your stepfather that we were just saw on the tape. Yes. Now, Lonnie is Chloe's mom. And she told us there are several areas where Chloe needs to clean up her act. And one of the questions you posed for me is how do you move back home? How do you get back on track, right? I mean, because right now things aren't going very well. You're working where? It's at a jelly factory. At a jelly factory? Yeah. <laughs> do you, you make jelly? Well, no. I put caps on jars and put them in boxes. You put caps on jars. Well, that's honest work. <laughs> Your mom thinks that you need to return to college. She wants you to strive for a career that you can feel good about other than being working in a jelly factory. She wants you to be safe, and she just thinks that you're not really safe. And this job can be dangerous that you're on, right? Didn't you get injured recently? Yeah. What happened? <laughs> I was taking salsa off the conveyor belt, and it just dumped on me. And I have a big burn on my arm. You actually have a trust fund that'll pay for college, right? Yes. And it'll give you cash on top of that for living expenses. Mm -hmm. And you actually had the opportunity to play basketball in college. You could be going to college funded by your trust fund plus paying you some money. You could be playing sports and accomplishing something there. But instead, you're in Kansas working in a jelly factory. Yeah. I mean, how's all that working for you? Well, when I originally moved down to Kansas, I was enrolled in Washburn University, and I was going to play basketball there, too, because I right. was on the team. And then stuff happened with my dad, and I had to drop out. 
Now, the one thing that really seemed to derail Chloe was discussing the nature of her relationship with Dusty and whether or not they saw each other the night before the show taping. Let's take a look at that, and then we'll talk about it. Right, good, bad, or indifferent, are you obsessed with this Dusty guy? No. You're not? No. We got copies of your phone records here. This is in one month, and I think the number of contacts you had with him was 239 times. He called you twice. Does that seem obsessive to you when you kind of see it in, in print? I'm not obsessed with him. And you started dating her when she was 16? Not dating her. Everyone said we're dating. I don't know why. Everyone keeps saying he's my boyfriend. Have you seen each other since you got here? No. You, you didn't walk over to her hotel last night and see her? No. I'm trying to find out who's telling me the truth and who's not. Okay, Alex is a producer. You're telling me something different than these guys are telling me. I was told that uh, Dusty did walk over to Chloe's hotel last night. And who told you that? Uh, Chloe did this morning. Are you lying to him or are you lying to me? I'm going to walk off and it's over. I'm done. Okay. You know, the, the, one thing we know is that the tape doesn't lie. Because that was you, that was then. Um, and you walked off because why? That just made me really mad. What made you mad? The, that you got caught in a lie? Well, just the actual lie. Like, I didn't see why it... I was kind of personal. Well, you could have said that. But you lied, and Dusty lied, and then he called the producer a, a, a name... I mean, if, if you're here to redeem yourself, there's a point at which you just have to kind of start dealing with the truth with, with yourself and everybody else. Because at this point, you are on your own. You can do anything you want to do. Your mother did not come here today. We asked her if she wanted to come here today. She said, I do not. She wants to be on her own. She wanted to move and go away. She's 18. She gets what she wants. Goodbye and good luck. There's nobody trying to tell you what to do. There's nobody telling you, you you can chase Dusty the rest of your life. You can live in Kansas. You can go to Oregon. You can work at a jelly factory. You can do, you do whatever you want. People are saying, okay. And so you, you do get to a point where you have to realize, you know what? The choices I'm making, the uh, only person that's impacted by those is you. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Soak all of that up. All right, now, Chloe isn't the only guest on that show to return today. Dusty is here. Uh, he has a lot to say. I'm curious to see what that is. We'll be right back. It's been about three and a half months since I've seen Dusty. You can't, like, expect me to come all the way to L.A. and just, like, fall for you again. I love Dusty. I'll probably love him forever. bringing back guests that many of you consider to be our most difficult, uh, including 18-year-old Chloe, who stomped off this stage during a show called Teens Obsessed with Love. Because her mom thought she was obsessed with a guy named Dusty. Uh, she said, no, I'm not obsessed. Uh, I asked her some questions, and she lied. She admits now that she lied uh, about this boy named Dusty. Now, Chloe hasn't seen Dusty since she left her parents' house and moved a 1,000 miles away until this week. And our cameras were rolling for their reunion, so here it is. When I got home, uh, me and Dusty actually dated again probably in June for a good month, and it was most serious we've probably been. And then uh, he started cheating on me. Things got stressful, because the other girl that I was seeing kind of got in the way. When that happened, I just told Dusty that I'm gonna be done with him and move to Kansas. Of course, I missed him. I got my number changed, and then she ended up giving me this sob story how she's so alone. So I gave her my number once, and then she, like, went overboard with it. She blew up my phone all night, texted me all the time. She had, like, three other numbers she was calling me on. I had her blocked. It gets really annoying. It's been about three and a half months since I've seen Dusty. When I first saw him, it was just, like, like I never left. Chloe is persistent at not giving up. You said you didn't have a girlfriend, and you're separated on Facebook, remember? You can't, like, expect me to come all the way to L.A. and just, like, fall for you again. I didn't say that. 
not like I'm going to get together and, you know, have sex with her and work things out with her. I don't plan on doing anything like that. And you broke up with me, and then you started cheating on her with me, so... I don't cheat on people. I just want to understand that I just like her as a friend. And you said you kind of have a girlfriend. You love her? I mean, kind of girlfriend. Being here for a day will definitely give us time to reconnect. I think we'll hang out a lot. I love Dusty. I'll probably love him forever. When you were here before, you were pretty belligerent with people, which doesn't seem to actually be your, your character. Why, why do you think, what was affecting you at the time? Um, just, you know, I was getting accused of stealing, or having her steal $10,000 from her parents, which yeah. it had nothing to do with me, you know. Yeah. Were you doing drugs when you were here before? When I was here? Uh-huh. No. So you weren't involved with heroin then? Oh, not heroin, uh, Oxycontin. Since the show, did you get involved with heroin? Mm-hmm. Yes. You were doing like 100 bucks a day? Yes. Of heroin? And you stopped that, right? Oh, yes. Okay. Sad my, uh, my good friend died over uh, July 5th, or July 5th, yeah. Um, that kind of changed a lot of perspective with me. He, he overdosed? Overdosed, yeah. yeah. Um, people left him in someone's yard to die. That was kind of a wake-up call to you to not be messing with that stuff? Right. Well, really, I mean, that's dangerous stuff, and I'm, I'm glad that, that you're not doing that. You're in love with him? Yeah, I mean, I think so anyways. Yeah. Um, is she still after you pretty much? Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm not trying to throw anyone under the bus like last time, you know. You've had to block her phone number so she can't call you? Yes. And you've got two phones and you only gave her one number, right? Yes. Until yesterday when I found out he had two phones. <laughs> so you squeezed that number out of him? Yeah. No, she just knew. It was one of my old ones, and she just... See, this is what I don't get. This is what nobody here gets, because we look at you, and you are just gorgeous, and you're intelligent, and you can be charming. You can be really not charming, but... <laughs> but you can really be... You can really be charming, and and it, it seems to me that... that you can talk about flaws or fallacies with Dusty or whatever, but it does seem to me that at one level he's he's been pretty straight with you. Yeah. I mean, you've been you've been pretty honest with her that you you don't want a relationship, right? You don't see a future with her romantically, like getting married or whatever. True. I'm not really trying to have a relationship on my back. Yeah. And and you you have girlfriends, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, you have well, you know he has girlfriends because you crawled through his bedroom window <laughs> when one of them was over there. Correct. Well, I was dating him at the time, so I think I had a right to crawl through his window. Well, <laughs> you you crawled through his window and she was there. Yeah. Well, I knew she was there because her car was outside. So that's why you crawled through the window yeah because she was laying there in his bed <laughs> i was like i probably overreacted again you wound up in jail for a variety of reasons right yes and did you write her a love letter from jail yes and so as a result you said well here i got it in writing <laughs> right yeah what happened to that love letter i don't have it anymore <laughs> what happened to it didn't you rip it up and chew it up and spit it back at her <laughs> Yes, I did. See, I'm getting these signs. I know. Okay, Chloe's parents said that she had a bad habit of stealing money and giving it to her boyfriend, something that she admitted sort of to a degree. Take a look. Are you giving him money? Occasionally I have. It's not like an everyday thing. Oh, I give Dusty money. That's what I do. I go to work to pay Dusty. No. Have you stolen money from your family? Yes. How much have you stolen? Probably a thousand. You have stolen three thousand dollars. No. And you didn't steal the ten thousand no. dollars that was missing from the desk in the barn. No. Okay. Do you think she did? 
I definitely think that she did. First of all, the barn is not locked. Who keeps that much money in a desk in a barn? And then blames it on me well, when it was they... there for an extremely short period of time. I would have just known about this money. Why? What would I possibly you do with that much with money? Mom yeah, the time when it to her. Did, did you the... take the ten thousand dollars? No. And we... you said you'll take a polygraph to prove that. Yes. Because I can arrange that for you, and then that'll be off the table for fine. you. Yes. That would be nice. You, you yeah. would like to know that. Why not? Now. The polygraph examiner set this up and asked you, did you steal any of Dean's money that was hidden in the barn? Right? Mm hmm And you said no. Okay. The polygraph result was inconclusive. This is a puzzle to me because... We went to great lengths to do this. I mean, we, we flew you out here to do this. You said you wanted to clear your name. You wanted to take the polygraph. We, we brought in Jack Tremarco, who is a top former FBI polygraph guy. Top notch, right? And we told you, if you're going to take this polygraph, you cannot take any drugs. You cannot do alcohol. You cannot have anything that would alter your chemistries, correct? All right. But you did drink the night before. Right. And did you smoke marijuana? Yeah. The day of? Yeah. And that just sends it out of control. And I was concerned about it because you guys have to understand when you're in a in, in a studio environment, you, you always hear all of these politicians. You, you'll see them, they're up on the podium and they give a speech. And then they walk off and they don't know that their mics are still hot. And they say something that they didn't mean for everybody to hear. Listen to this. How are you getting weed? I don't know. I'll find weed. Los Angeles, dude. I found weed. <laughs> <laughs> You, you were leaving the interview and you, you shut the door, but you, your your mics were still hot. And what what are you doing smoking weed the day you're taking a polygraph? Come on. Why didn't he stop it then? Because he asked me, and why did he continue to? Because he was going to do everything he could to try to get a protocol. Is that why I took it like ten times? To clear you, because the truth is, he thinks you're telling the truth. He really does. He's, he, was, he was doing everything he could. Well, he to did a try practice one, and it showed when I was lying, and it. Yeah. He told me to lie on purpose. And well, of course. It, yeah. And you it you do it to get. You know, he was trying to get every kind of reactivity, and if you if you take any kind of stimulant, depressant, anything at all, it, it invalidates the profile. He was he was hoping that he would get something that would help you here, because we're trying so much. Uh, to help you here. We're, we're trying to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. But our hope and prayer was that it would show that you did not take the money. Mm -hmm. So your your parents could say, okay, wow, okay, we, needed, we needed to know that. Now, there was something that did not come out on the last show, uh, and I think it has to do with some of Chloe's anger. We're going to talk about that when we come back. We're talking with returning guests who many consider to be people that were highly resistant, rude, had a difficult time uh, dealing with what was going on. Um, what is it about old Dusty here that... He asks me that all the time. I don't know. You, you asked the same question? Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you did leave and move a thousand miles away. It was because he wanted me to leave him alone, so... I was like, well, obviously I can't do it if I'm in Ohio, so I'll just... Leave. <laughs> and so you'll move to Kansas. And I wanted to meet my dad. So. Right. You wanted to meet your dad. And she said it because we're talking about her biological father, and she never knew her bio dad, James, existed really for the first half of your life. True? True. And um, uh, Chloe's biological dad, James, has been in and out of trouble for years. Uh, he's been in jail, much like... Dusty has the here, same name too. and in fact, he, your your biological dad is in jail right now. Yeah. Um, 
but we do have him on the phone because he, he wanted to talk to you and uh, tell you what's going on. James, are you there? Yes, how are you, Dr. Phil? Good. Thanks so much for joining us. I'm sorry that you're doing it from um, jail. I, I wish that wasn't the case, but how long are you likely to be in jail at this point? Uh, probably about 26 months this time. Okay, and well, that's a good stretch there. How, what what are the charges that you're in jail for? I'm actually in here on a probation violation. All my troubles from years ago, it's just my past caught up with me. Uh huh. And you've been in jail for a number of years during Chloe's upbringing, right? 14 years? Correct. Which is why you weren't in connection. Now, you, Chloe, you were actually with your dad when he was arrested? this last time and it yeah. scared the bejeebers out of you, right? What happened? I don't know, we were driving down the road and all of a sudden like 10 cop cars came at us <laughs> at a gun point, so. They had a gun pointed mm -hmm. at you? Oh yeah, and my dad. And handcuffed you? Mm-hmm. And, because they didn't know who you were? I guess because I was just in the car with them. Okay, and w when they found out who you were, what happened? They and let they, you go, I oh, mean yeah. you didn't do they, anything wrong. No, they said they were sorry and they told me how to get back. They gave me their numbers because I just moved up there. I didn't know how to get all the way back. Right. James, what do you want to see happen here? Well, Dr. Phil, ultimately it's my, it's my wishes to see her go to school. I've told her that. Uh, when she first came down to Kansas, she really didn't want to go to school. It was, school was fixing to be three weeks away. Chloe was very confused. We rushed her into school. And I think getting to know me, and it was a lot of chaos and trying to get to know Chloe, it, it wasn't a good idea for her to go to school at that time, I don't believe, but we tried it and it didn't work. Now, you don't know Dusty at all, right? I just know of Dusty. Uh-huh. And you know that he's had some conflict with the law himself. How do you feel about that? I don't feel very good about it. Um, you know, when Chloe came here, for me to get to know her, um, it was... I, I was amazed because me and that girl are so much alike. Um, we say a lot of the same things. We, our behaviors, our hand movements, er, everything is very similar. And the fact that Dusty's so much like me, me and Chloe connected real well. But I don't really care, you know, wh which way Chloe goes in life as far as with Dusty. or I mean, she's going to do what she wants. I, I don't want to see her to end up like me. And, I mean, as much as I hate to say it, her seeing what happened to me, is a good example of what happens when you go the wrong way in life. And I hope she learned something from that. I mean, it's, it's sad to say, but I, I really do, because I would never want to see her go in the steps that I have. I have to step back and look at what you, your journey has been. I mean, here you've got a father that spent 14 of your 18 years in jail. You didn't know he existed for half your life. You reach out to him and go see him. You're driving down the street. He gets busted. You've got a gun pointed at you, cuffs thrown on you. He's back in jail for over two years now. So that 14 years will now become 16 years out of, out of 20 for you. Uh, you're living in a situation where your mother has married someone new, and they have a, a, a second family there, and everybody seems to just be peachy. And then, you know, here you are kind of on the periphery of all of this. Is that a fair assessment? Mm -hmm. um, but don't you get tired of fighting? Yeah. I mean, doesn't it really get tiresome? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you want to do? I have no idea at this point. I would like to stay in Kansas and I don't, I really don't think I want to go back to school. But you, you can't love your job at the jelly factory. No. <laughs> I mean, seriously, that's not a, that's not a career position, right? Right. But, you know, those days can turn into weeks and weeks can turn into months. And then before you know it, you're getting your five-year pen at the jelly factory. And, you know, really, you know, I mean, that's what happens. You, you just... You, you kind of start surviving instead of striving, and next thing you know, it's it, it's slipping away. Um, what do you want to see her do? Jelly's good and all, but I mean, I think <laughs> I think she can 
do better in school, for sure. Do you miss your mother? Sometimes. But you fear you would get back into this? So you think you should stay in Kansas? Yeah. For right now, anyways. And you say you're confused and, and don't really know what to do at this point, but if I were to arrange for you to have someone there to talk to, you know, a professional that was just for you, no, nobody went but you, where you could sit down and kind of say, well, let me kind of sort some of this out, would that be of any interest to you? Probably not, honestly. Okay, that's okay. I, I think you have conducted yourself like a lady. I, I think you've been very honest uh, with me and the questions I've had and the comments that I've made. And, and as a result, I'm very willing to try to help you in, in any way that I can. So if you want someone to talk to, at some point you tell me, I'll make it available. If you want to take that polygraph, Again, we'll chalk that up to misunderstanding. I'll make that available to you. And, you know, we'll see if there's some basis for rebuilding this relationship with your family. If they owe you an apology, they need to give it to you. Mm -hmm. And and so we'll, you, you think about those things and we'll go forward. Okay? Right. Fair enough? Okay. All right, we're going to take a break. You remember Todd. He was a guy who faked his death pretending he drowned from an Alaskan crab boat accident. Uh, after that show, Todd left some very threatening voicemails. You're going to hear those next. We'll be right back. You portrayed me online as an adulteress. Now, we'll track your narrow ass down, and we're going to get this thing straight. Well, you may remember Todd, one of my more, shall we say, creative guests. He spun quite a few tales on this stage, and so did his wife. Now, during the first show, his wife admitted that she embellished the truth about charges that sent him to jail for nearly a year. Take a look. I spent 10 months in jail, 282 days for assault, based on a charge from Deborah that I had pushed her. There was no truth to it whatsoever. Did you file a false police report to put this guy in jail? No. Yes, she did. Did you or did you not misrepresent what happened to the police? There was absolutely assault. There would have been physical signs of assault. I would have been taken into custody. Show me what you're talking about. I'm standing in the door. I, all I did She's blocking you like it, this? And I, push, I pushed through like this, and that's what I did. She infuriated me by what she did to me. Right now, I have thoughts of revenge against her, and I can't get rid of them. I think it would be a good idea if she spent 30 or 45 days in jail for what she did to me. Did you make statements that weren't true? I may have said that there was there was punching or hitting. You either said he hit me and punched me or you didn't. Did I, you say I did. You did. I did. And did he hit you and punch you? No. So you made a conscious decision to embellish the story. Well, after that show, Todd got revenge against his wife when he made up assault charges that got her arrested. And on top of that, we received notice that Todd had accidentally drowned in an Alaskan crab boat accident. Or did he? Because Todd and his wife returned to this stage a few months later. After I moved out, I did do a brief stint with a company in Alaska. I worked on a processing boat. The 12th or 13th of December, I received a text message that said that he had passed away. I was actually on the dock, and one of those big square pod things that kind of squashed me. Got hurt, was in the hospital three days. Did you fake your death? No, I did not. You posted a letter out of South Carolina on the 11th of December when you supposedly are getting crushed by a crab pot. You didn't spend three days in no, the sir. hospital because we've talked to the hospital and you yes, were sir. never there. You can't work on a processing boat in a fishery up there without a license. You never got a license. You couldn't work there. We've talked to the woman you're renting a room from that says you never left. Let's just go whole hog. You faked your death. 
to it against him. Now, on top of the emotional devastation, I have to I have to deal with the fact that you're living with another woman while we're still married. Definitely. Where does it stop with you, Todd? Where does it stop? I'm Where renting, does it end with you? I'm renting a room. She's an older lady. Yeah. We're not right. boyfriend oh, girlfriend. Yeah. I'm supposed to believe this because why? I don't know whether he has a romantic relationship with her or he's just renting a room. I don't know, but I do know she's on the phone. <laughs> Have you had a romantic relationship with this man? No. So this isn't a sexual... Strictly, this is strictly a roommate situation. Todd? You don't even have an iota of what you have put me through. You have emotionally devastated me. Well, after that show, Todd, who is here, started obsessively calling and harassing the show. Now, we record things here, and we save the recordings of the voicemails Todd left for us after the show. Hey, smartass, this is Todd. Give me a call, buddy. I'm not messing with you now. I want you to explain to me and look me dead in the eyes, and I want you to tell me exactly why you portrayed me online as an adulterer. That's exactly what you did with that bull with Deborah about me living with another woman. Right now, my head's about to come off. I'm so damn pissed off at you for what you've done. You man up and call me before 5 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, man. If you don't, I'm out to L.A., and I'm going to drag your little ass out of that damn studio. I don't give two who you're with or who you're employed with or Paramount or who ever. But right now, I can't even see straight. You live in L.A., I live in the deep south, and we do things differently here, all right? And I believe in retribution right here and right now. I swear to God, I'm coming out there this weekend, and I will track your narrow ass down, and we're going to get this thing straight. You're going to man up to this bull****. Why are you back here now? Well, I owe, an apo I owe several apologies. Uh, first of all, to you. You know, I wasted your time that last episode. I owe huge apologies to Phil and Alex, who have been fantastic to me every time I've been out here, and your audience and your viewers. Um, I, you could have had, you know, I need to own up to, to everything you said that you were trying to get out of me was true. Uh, and like the young lady said when she was out here, when, when you're sitting, it's not an excuse, but when, you know, you have someone talking on the speaker and, you know, you have your cards and you're asking questions and it, it comes at you like a freight train. And it's not an excuse. You just should just tell the truth and be done with it because well, I just wasted, wasted your time when you could have been helping someone else. It, it, it comes at you like a freight train if you're trying to sort out a bunch of lies. Correct. But if, if you're actually here and you say... You know, Dr. Phil, I, I've, I've written you a letter, I've asked for help, I'm, I'm coming here and I'm going to tell you the truth so you can deal with the facts and Absolutely. help me with my life, then it's not overwhelming at all. And, you know, I, 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 I do my homework. I mean, yes. I, I had checks and bank statements and security cameras of you standing at home when you were supposedly up here. Correct drowning on a crab boat. Yes, sir. Which was an amazingly creative lie. No, it was horrible. I At mean, the time it was concocted I mean, and, and executed, I mean, it I mean, seemed that's like amazingly... I mean, where did that come from in your head? Uh, I had accepted a job in Alaska, and I had all my paperwork completed and sent in. That's where I came up with, with the idea of using that as an excuse. And to be honest with you, it was the months that she thought I was dead, it was the most peaceful months during the entire two and a half, three years that I'd ever had. Were you drinking when you made these calls threatening my staff members? Absolutely. When, when you write emails and you make long-distance phone calls that are interstate... Correct. ...and they're threats mm -hmm. and, and, and terrorizing, mm -hmm. that, that could be a, f a federal crime. Absolutely. Um, that was pointed out to me. Yeah, I would think. Because this is a book of the emails mm -hmm. that you have written uh, Correct. to us. And a lot of those are probably forwarded emails that I had received from her that I just yeah, for record. Most of these are from you. you know, yeah. Um, we'll be right back.
If you were going to fabricate this elaborate ruse, faking your death, did, did you really think you were going to blow that one by me? I knew enough. I knew that you guys would do your homework and, 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 and invest. But you did surprise me on a couple of things about the, the picture and, 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 you know, certain things like that. But it was just a, it was a response that, I mean, I was raised better than that. You called here and, and wrote here with all of these threats to our staff. Did you ever apologize to them? Um, I didn't have contact with them. Uh, until about a week and a half ago, I think. And I had called into the main number. I got a hold of Alex. Um, I had left Phil a message. I, I don't know that if I did apologize to them directly on the phone. I, I told them that I appreciated everything that they did. You know, you have a great staff here. I told them that. But you, you, you lied to me. You threatened everybody on this staff. And yes, you sir. never apologized for it. I didn't call back. No, sir, I didn't. Are you drinking now? Today? No, not no, right now. No, no, absolutely not. Well, I, I guess, I no, guess, sir. yes. Are you, no, are you drunk? No, are you sir. drunk now? No, I'm not. Okay. No, sir. Have you been, have you been abusing alcohol? Absolutely. Yes, I have. Um, why are you doing that? I've just let it get out of control to where it's an every night thing. Sometimes I can't, I'll look at my phone the next day. I don't know if anyone else can relate to this out there. And you see all these numbers you dialed and well, okay, here's about six people I got to call up because I probably pissed them off last night. So you're drunk dialing and you're blacking out. And you, yes, sir. And and and, it, and you, there's been a lot of anger that's that's that that I think is just it's finally at this age that goes back probably 20 years through the course of this 20 years that's coming to surface that that right now it's just getting to where I'm having a hard time dealing with it. Are you are you going to AA meetings? Do, no, are sir. you in any kind of treatment? No, are sir. you in any kind of? So I, I know the part of the country that that you're in, and uh, I will have our resource director, Anthony, uh, talk with you after the show and see if we can guide you to some some resources to get you started down the right road. Okay. Because you don't, you don't want to be doing this. No, I, I don't. I commend you for being here. I, I certainly accept your apology to Thank me. I, I will help you as best I can, okay. and we'll see what happens. All right. Thank you All very right, much. We'll Well, I really want to thank our guests for coming back today. I think sometimes uh, things that seem like a good idea at the time on reflection don't seem like such good ideas. W one thing I can say is if somebody comes on this show, I think I owe it to them to tell them the truth as I see it. Because a lot of times you don't get that. You know, people tell you what you want to hear. They'll pat you on your hand tell you it's going to be okay uh, when it's not. So, I mean, I... I tell people the truth, and if that's what you want to hear, I'm your guy. And if you don't, I'm not your guy. I'm going to do my homework, and I'm going to tell you the truth as I see it. And, Chloe, I, I don't want to see you spending the rest of your life working in unskilled jobs. And not that there is anything wrong with those jobs. I, I've been a car hop at an A&W. I've been the guy that held a stick for a surveyor. I've done every kind of job that you can imagine, and it's honest work, and it's okay. But you want to challenge yourself, and, and you know, I hope you do that. You, you, you have such a terrific future that you can have ahead of you, and that's all I want for you. I mean, I, I, mean, I really do. Uh, be sure to check us out on drphil.com. You can find me on Facebook. You can find me on Twitter, and you can find me right here tomorrow. We'll see you. So long.